Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, pregnancy-focused chiropractor, Dr. Elliot Berlin. My guest today is an actor, voice teacher, business coach. She just had her first baby, and boy, was it a journey. Jenna Pastizak, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's sort of greedy because I love hanging out with you. So I was like, hey, maybe come on the podcast and share your cool background and pregnancy twisty experience. Well, I feel the same way. I was so happy that uh, I got to see you twice today. I know. What a day. It's a double Jenna day, my favorite kind of day. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from a small town called Swarthmore. It's right outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Well, how long were you there? I was born and raised there. You know, I was born in the town and I uh, went to college from that town. So, you know, I spent the first 18 years of my life growing up in this tree hugging town outside of the city of brotherly love and enjoying all of the fine delicacies of Philadelphia, such as tasty cakes, soft pretzels, cheese oh, steaks, you know. Amazing health. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> brotherly love <laughs> is another way of saying heart disease. Okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So that means you were a sophomore and swathmore. That's right. Wow. And swathmore, just so you know, is spelled S W A R T H M O R E. But when you're from there, the R is silent. But if you're not there, it's swathmore. Yeah. Oh. So people will say, oh, Swarthmore College. And I'm like, no, it's Swarthmore. Swarthmore. Everybody in the know knows that. Now we know. Now we do. If nothing else, we have informed pregnant people about that. Oh my, my mission is complete. <laughs> so you came from Swarthmore, and you're an amazing actor, singer, and you share your talent by teaching and performing. How did you get into all of that? Well, you know, when I was little... Actually, my next door neighbor came over to our house one day and she went up to my mom and she said, uh, you know, Jenna's singing to the trees outside. right?" <laughs> and my mom was like, yeah, I know. And she said, well, have you considered putting her into therapy or maybe musical theater? <laughs> Aren't they one in the same? And my mom thought, you know, musical theater classes are cheaper than therapy and Less therapy, expensive. therapy came later. Yep. I get your mom. Yeah, so I bit the bug. Actually, my mom took me up to one of the perks of being from Philadelphia is that, you know, you're 90 minutes from New York City. So my mom thought, okay, well, she loves singing to the trees, so may as well take her up to New York City to see a Broadway show. So when I was six, she took me up to see Les Miserables on Broadway, and she was like, well, let's go up for a Sunday matinee. Because that way, if Jenna gets bored or something, you know, we can just leave an intermission. <laughs> so, you know, the show starts. This is the three and a half hour musical. And so the show starts. We do all of act one. A few people die during act one. And then at intermission, she looks at me and she says, OK, are you ready to go? And I turn my head quickly and I say, isn't there more? And she was <laughs> like, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how you got into it. That's how I got into it lucky i mean that you were singing to those trees uh, lucky trees is all i'm thinking very lucky trees okay so then how old were you then when you did that well when i started singing to the trees you know probably five six and then i started my first musical theater class when i was in fourth grade so i think i was nine and then i just continued on my merry way i started studying classical voice at age 11 and then by the time i was in high school i was doing all of the choirs and i was doing the musical and i remember that everyone thought oh well you're gonna go to conservatory or you know school for musical theater and i was like no I am not a theater person. I am a person who does theater. I do not want theater to define my existence. And so I ended up going to the University of Virginia and I studied Wait history. Wait a second. Yeah. I'm not a theater person. I am a person who does theater because you didn't want theater to define your existence. And so instead, does. your existence defines theater. Right. Wow. Right. right. Wow. Okay. Full circle. That just exploded in my head. Okay, so you didn't go to a conservatory. I didn't even try. I think I was putting on a front, you know, saying to everyone, oh, I'm not this 
dork. I'm not, you know, this person who's obsessed with talking about theater, you know, celebrities as if they're my friends. I am above that. But in reality, I was terrified of getting rejected. So I didn't even try. I didn't even audition because I didn't want to be told. At that point, I was so great at being a big fish in a small pond that I was too afraid to step out of my waters and see how I fit in, you know, compared to my competition. So I played the safe zone. And then when I was 21, I was doing my final year at UVA. I was an elementary education major. And so I was student teaching fourth grade. And I was teaching a unit on Roald Dahl, who's one of my favorite authors. And I was reading the BFG out loud to the class. And I'm thinking to myself, something is not right. And ultimately what I figured out was, wow, this is the first time in my life I'm not doing any kind of performing. I'm not in voice lessons. I'm not with my college acapella group. I'm not doing a student run show or something in the drama department. This thing is way more important to me than I ever thought. And actually I am a theater person. So I got to pivot. So I ended up going up to New York and I auditioned for NYU to do a master's in vocal performance for musical theater. And I got in. And then when I was there, I realized they had a dual degree program so I could also get my degree in vocal pedagogy at the same time. And so I said, wow, not only can I learn to sing, but I can teach people how to sing. And isn't that better than waiting tables? So that's what I did. That's impressive. First of all, I love like your self-honesty that you realized that you were just not willing to go out of your comfort zone. And that was holding you back. I think that happens to, if not all of us, many of us at times. And hearing somebody just say it out loud is courageous. It makes me feel like "Mm, maybe I should have gone and majored in vocal pedagogy. But I can't even really say vocal pedagogy the right way so it's a really fancy word it's probably not my thing or maybe i'm just it's because you can't say swarthmore i can't say swarthmore (laughs) i'm not a swarthmore pedagogical anyway so wow okay and now like flash forward you do cool shows now i do cool shows so yeah you know i've decided screw that whole i don't want to be, you know, a small fish in a big pond. I ended up living in New York City for 10 years and now I live in Los Angeles. So I decided to go into the largest pools possible and see how I could make it work. And so I've just continued swimming along in these ponds and doing all kinds of shows, whether that's workshops of new musicals. So what that means is that the writers have there's something and they want to see if it works so they're trying it on bodies so maybe you do three days it's called a 29 hour reading and you put as much material on its feet as possible maybe that's script in hand or it's a full staging of the show i've done out of town tryouts so what that means is people have a show and they want to get it to broadway but it needs to be workshopped out of town in regional theater so that it's not destroyed by reviewers and so that people who own these Broadway theaters can come and see it and decide if they want to put it in their theater and also so producers can come and decide if they want to invest in it. So I've done those, I've done cabarets and concerts, and I'm currently working on self-producing. So over the past two years, I started creating my own work and then touring it around to theaters who were attempting to pivot in the times of COVID and create COVID safe performances for their audiences. So I created these one woman shows that could be done socially distanced just with me and a piano six feet apart. And I've performed them everywhere from parking lots to beautiful stages because even performed for the JCC of Toledo, Ohio. <gasps> Holy at, Toledo. At 9 a.m. on Zoom from my bedroom. Yeah. Wow. And they were one of the best audiences I had. It was maybe 25, 30 people on Zoom just giving me jazz hands every time I finished <laughs> a song. It was great. Oh, uh, that's also courageous. You know what? Because, uh, like, I know when I stopped doing stand up comedy, A lot of people went on Zoom to do it. And I was like, that takes a whole new level of talent and skill to be able to do that and do it with confidence and connect with the people on the other side that aren't in the room with you. That's cool. Thanks. 
Kudos to you. And you have an amazing just even speaking voice. Is that something that develops through the different trainings you have? Or is that just like, you know, maybe it's Maybelline or maybe? <laughs> well, as I call my voice, I call it the gift. It's a very expensive gift that um, I'm really grateful that my parents invested in from an early age and that I've continued to invest in. So I've definitely done my fair share of vocal training. And I also do voiceover work. So I understand the importance of being able to add nuance and subtlety to your voice. So if anyone Ooh. out there is looking to hire a voiceover actor, call me. Oh, I love that. Hey, call us. Hi, this is my cool voice that I use to sell products just subtly. Hmm. This is my voice that I use when I'm trying to convince my kids I'm sleeping. Don't bother me. <laughs> but they don't fall for it, so I'm not very good at it. I should have gone I'm trying, to school. I'm trying that on my infant. He, he's really not buying it. <laughs> Yeah, well, if they're not buying it from you, they're definitely not buying it from this novice over here. Okay, so you were self-producing, and now all of a sudden you're reproduced, but not alone with a partner. Where'd you meet that guy? High school. High school in Swarthmore? In Swarthmore, yeah. Wow, so he also says Swarthmore. Yeah, he does. Are you in the same grade? No, he was a year older. We met outside of the soft hop a.k.a. the sophomore hop, which was the sophomore dance. And he was a sophomore. I was a freshman. I was there with another guy. And then after the dance, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up in the parking lot. And he came over and we shook hands and I introduced myself. And then later that night, he called my house. Wow. Yeah. You were a freshman and you got a phone call from a sophomore in Swarthmore? Yeah, at like 11 p.m. It was you know, 11 p.m. Yes, that's, that's gutsy. Well, that's yeah. ballsy for an out of town sophomore. He put himself out there and I was like, OK. And so we dated for three years and he ended up going to Loyola College in Baltimore. And then he came out actually to L.A. to go to Cal State Long Beach. And then what does he study? What does he do? He works for Vox Media in podcast sales. So he's the head of podcasts over there. Oh, well, who does podcasts? They're so something. So last month. <laughs> so, yeah. So we dated for three years and then we went our separate ways for five. And then we both ended up in New York at the same time. And we thought, oh, hey, let's get together and catch up. It's been a while. And then we caught up and we're like, wait a minute. There might be something here. Hmm. And then, boom. The rest is history. Yeah. Then you have a kid. But that also wasn't the simplest thing. Maybe we should take a little break and come back and find out about your journey to parenthood. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. We're talking to Cole Jenna. So you guys, you know, get it together. And like kids, was that a plan early on? Yeah, you know, Ben wanted kids from the get-go. And he kept saying, well, let's have kids, let's have kids, let's have kids. And I said, la, 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 I can't hear you. Because that's what you do, you sing. Yeah, exactly. La, la, if, la, I sing, la, la. if I sing loud enough, maybe that thought about having kids will go away. What was it about not having kids that appealed to you? You know, I'm Ukrainian and I'm stubborn. So <laughs> there's that. And so I had decided in my brain that until I reached a certain threshold in my career, I could not have children. I could not take the time away to become a mom until I felt successful enough to not hypothetically resent my child for getting in the way of my quote unquote necessary success definers. And so I thought that I needed to have my Broadway debut before I had children. And so in 2020, I had decided this is my year. I'm going to have my Broadway debut this year. So I'm not going to go out of town and do any regional work. I'm not going to let anything else distract me. I want to focus on getting on Broadway. And then, of course, the global pandemic happened and Broadway shut down for almost two years. So mm. I cannot continue to wait and I can't let this be this defining thing. And I actually had a voice client, one of my clients, a dancer. I was speaking to her about it and she said to me, she said, Jenna, what if actually at your Broadway debut, 
your kid is sitting in the front row. <gasps> and then your kid is thinking, that's my mom. And all of a sudden, once she said that to me, I had this complete brain shift. And I was like, wow, I hadn't even considered that a possibility. And how cool would that be for my child to see me continuing to pursue the thing that I love and then get to share that with me? That's so awesome. So then I changed my mind. Cool. I mean, that is very neat. The Watching the thing that you love, seeing you doing the thing that you love. Yeah. <laughs> and so that comes into my birth story, which I'll share. Oh, very exciting. Okay. But before birth is inception and that took a minute for you. Sure did. Again, like I said, I'm Ukrainian and I'm stubborn and I love a plan. So I decided, okay, we are leaving New York City. We're driving across the country to Los Angeles. We're going to start fresh. And I was in Arches National Park and I suddenly had the space to look around and see America. And I heard this little voice that said, it's time. Oh. So I said, okay, it's time. I'm going to throw this Nuva ring in the nearest trash can. And now I'm going to get pregnant immediately. Just like they said in middle school sex education class. You know, <laughs> I'll take out this birth control. My period will come back. And the next thing you know, I'll be knocked up with child. Wrong. <laughs> Wait a second. You didn't get periods on the Nuva ring? They were like minuscule. They weren't even something to write home about. Yeah. It really? was like, yeah, very, very light periods. So yeah. more comfortable? Very comfortable. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by Nuva Ring. Nuva Ring. Okay. Berlin 10. Yeah. Berlin 10 is the code. Save 10% <laughs> off your Nuva Ring, but you only get 90% of it. And also, it's covered by FSA. So $0. Ah, FSA. And some people don't have that experience with the Nuva Ring. So. Oh, really? Use at your own discretion. Oh. But, all right. So you get off the ring and boom, you're supposed to get like instantly pregnant. Instantly pregnant. Well, turns out I never got my period back. My period never showed up and I still was able to have a child. So it turned you don't even need a period to get pregnant. Oh, you never got it never. back. Never so, returned. I mean, how do you know when to uh, or you just always have to be? Connecting with your partner? Well, <laughs> I mean, I was trying to conceive for a while, so I didn't have to about ovulation or anything because I wasn't ovulating. It turns out what happened is I figured out, okay, obviously my period is not here, so something is not right. So at first I tried to heal myself naturally. I went to acupuncture. I drank a lot of Chinese herbs, so I spent a lot of time decanting and making these really delicious concoctions. And by delicious, I mean, plug your nose and just chase that thing. Back. Ooh, yuck. And so I did that for about nine months and I focused on meditating and I focused on, you know, reducing stressors in my body. And ultimately I was diagnosed with hypothalamic amenorrhea. And so what that means is that means my brain, my hypothalamus is not speaking to my ovaries to tell it to release eggs. Hmm. So the fertility doctors were like, you have a million eggs, but no one is telling them to do anything. So they're all just sitting there. So finally, I decided that I was ready to bring in Western medical assistance. And so what we did is we did a round of letrozole. And letrozole is a medication that helps boost your follicles in your ovaries. Then they monitor it. And so once the follicles are big enough, then they will tell you to take a trigger shot. And the trigger shot will trigger a follicle to release an egg. So it's basically a forced ovulation. Then along with this, you're supposed to do what they call timed intercourse. And so then they tell you to have sex for three days and see if that works. So the first round of this letrozole experiment we did and the follicles grew and grew and grew and died. Oh. And so that was a major bummer. And well, so it was then, like your uh, first Broadway play that you saw. <laughs> right. Lame is everyone's yeah. just dying by the end of the show. Yeah. And then by intermission, you're like, what happened? Isn't there more? <laughs> and there wasn't. 
and there wasn't. And so then I had to take the train back to Swarthmore, think about it. And then I had to get back on the New Jersey Transit at some point when I was ready and get back to New York and see another show. So that's what I did. In November, we did another round. This time we did the letrozole and we paired it with hormone injections. And I think I was also taking a low dose of progesterone. So the follicles grew and grew and grew and grew. And then they said, okay, take that trigger shot and then have sex for three days. Well, these three days also happen to coincide with me doing a workshop of a new musical in Los Angeles and making my LA debut at the Bourbon Room. And so the first night I was like, I'm too tired to have sex, I'm not doing that. (laughs) So I said, okay, I'm rolling the dice. We only have two nights to get this right. And I didn't wanna tell my husband because I was a little nervous. You know, I didn't want the extra stress of him knowing what was happening and you know getting anxious about it or something so but i'm confused you didn't tell him what i didn't tell him that we were having forced sexual intercourse (laughs) oh he didn't know that you're supposed to have sex for three days no i didn't he just thought wow he was just like something is jenna's look is it is this my new haircut is it (laughs) he's bald so he was like oh "Mm, Mm. yeah (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Clean. Okay. So first night he doesn't care because he doesn't even know. And then the next two nights. And then the next two nights he was like, hmm. Okay. And so then but he was like, I'm not gonna say anything because I'm going for it. Like this is shocking. Yes, obviously. Yeah, why not? So then I flew to New York. I was teaching and doing an audition or something. And I did my blood work two weeks later. And what's funny is that they did the blood work and they just sent me the results with no explanation. So I get this blood work and they're measuring whatever that hormone is that is in your blood. Beta HCG. HCG, exactly. So it's like HCG 3.56. And I'm like, what is that? (laughs) Googling what's HCG 3.56. And then, of course, Google is like, oh, it means you're pregnant. And I was like, wow, it worked. It worked. So I walk up to Times Square and I FaceTime Ben and I say, hey, Ben, I'm on Broadway and we're having a baby. (gasps) And he was like, what? And he's like, yeah, I was wondering why you wanted to have sex two days in a row. I thought that was weird. (laughs) Yeah, if only he knew it should have been three days in a row. But I guess the moral of the story is you don't need the first day. You don't. So, yeah, I was pregnant and I felt real bad for the first 10 weeks. Just super nauseous. The only thing I could eat was bread and cheese, which sounds great. You know, pizza, quesadillas, cheese. You're selling it. Wow. Yeah, but I couldn't even look at a piece of kale, look at broccoli. I was disgusted. Welcome to my world. (laughs) That's my every day. (laughs) Carbs and orange juice. That was what I was going for. And I was so tired. No one explains that. Yeah, the fatigue. So that cleared up after 10 weeks? Well, after 10 weeks, too, I had also been taking progesterone the whole first trimester. Injections? No, pills. By mouth? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I think after I stopped taking that, I did feel a lot better too. And then I hit the second trimester and I felt like myself. I was like, oh gosh, give me a broccoli, give me the kale, give me a smoothie. I feel great. I was working out just like normal. I was, you know, strength training and riding my Peloton bike and doing Pilates and yoga and walking a ton and just feeling super active sleeping great i slept on my back i think up to like 30 weeks i was <laughs> feeling comfy and i was flying a lot i was flying back and forth to the east coast to perform and to teach and yeah i was feeling great and, and eating kale and eating kale because i thought you know maybe my child needed those nutrients oh, what a mother what a mother wait we met at some point we met i think around 26 weeks maybe yeah that sounds right yeah that fateful day it was a great day (laughs) (laughs) we were my first chiropractic adjustment since the global pandemic and i was like wow 
I forgot how amazing this feels. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm so honored to be yeah. the one. <laughs> yeah. So what else were you doing during the pregnancy to take care of you to get ready for birth? Mm. Well, let's see. Uh, prenatal Pilates really saved me. My friend, Abby Suskin, she runs a Pilates group for prenatal and postnatal mamas. And I was actually amazed at how many similarities there are between prenatal Pilates and singing. All of a sudden, I was thinking, wow, every singer should be in prenatal Pilates all the time. Because all we're hmm. talking about is pelvic floor and core engagement. And there's this theory in singing that all sphincters are related. So if and when your pelvic floor is really, really tight, then most likely your throat is really tight too. Oh, yeah. That's a big pregnancy thing in birth. Yeah. Exactly. Right. They're always saying, you know, relax your jaw, relax your jaw. So exactly. it opens your pelvis. I'm starting to believe in this. All sphincters are related theory. Is a great theory. I feel like it'll be a great book too. Let's collaborate. Maybe a musical theater show. <laughs> it's I'll, all in the sphincter. Come I'll, see it on Broadway. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll be glad you did. <laughs> yeah. So I was doubly invested because I thought, wow, this is going to make my pregnancy really easy and my birthing experience really easy and also make me a better singer at the same time. Like, winner, winner, chicken dinner, I'm in. So I did those things. I also. I met a doula that I really liked. She is actually a pelvic floor physical therapist as well as a doula. And I thought, wow, this is going to be great for this all natural birth that I want to have for the reconstruction of my pelvic floor so that I can continue to sing and not be sidetracked with pelvic floor abnormalities after birth. So she will not only help me get through the birth, but then she'll also help me rehab. This is great. And I signed up for some classes. I took some great classes at Sparrow's Nest in Highland Park. Oh, yeah, Sparrow. Yeah. So I took a breastfeeding course. I took an infant care course, and then we took a birthing class. I also took infant CPR because I figured I was once a lifeguard, and I might as well dust off my skills and make sure I can save a choking child if and when needed. I traveled. You know, and I also continued to do what I love to do because I thought I want to take this tiny human. I didn't know what I was having, but so I wanted to take this small person with me and show them through their womb adventures, you know, what it's like to continue to do the things you love. So I took the tiny human to see a bunch of Broadway shows and see some tours, which was really fun to be at a show and then just being kicked in rhythm <laughs> to what was <laughs> happening. I continued performing myself and we traveled. We went to London. We went to Colorado. We went up to Carmel by the Sea. So, you know, I kept living my life as much as I could in service, continuing to move myself so that I didn't get, you know, stiff or sore. And also just to stay positive and active and keep my mind going instead of getting stressed out about the future, the unknown. Wow, that must have been cool being on stage, visibly pregnant, Ooh. like a cool experience for you and for your audience. Actually, a friend of mine said, she said, you know, it's so rare to get to see a pregnant woman on stage doing what she does, because often in Broadway shows, if and when you are pregnant, the costumers do a really great job of helping you hide it for as long as possible. Then they just have to kind of mask it for as long as they can. So for me to get up and get to tell these stories, you know, the great thing about doing these one woman shows and concerts is that I create the banter and the banter can adjust depending on what's happening in the world, what's happening in my life. And so I was able to speak about these iconic women who also happen to be mothers in these shows and also infuse it with my own stories and my own experience and i do this barbara streisand show and i talk about how she had a child she has a son and i imagine her singing these lullabies that she sung to her son and wondering what that will feel like when i have my own child and singing it to them so that was something really touching and sometimes would make me emotional on stage just thinking about how this person who I couldn't wait to meet was there in the womb with me and hearing me sing these songs. And I was so curious if and when they arrived, would they know the songs? And like, what would that mean to them? Well, 
pregnancy is going great, it sounds like, and it's almost time to give birth, and surely you have a plan. So let's take a little break and find out what that is. <laughs> Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. You know, in our story, Jenna's very pregnant and not held back at all, doing all the things and taking great care of herself. So what did you think? I know you had a doula and you wanted to not shred your pelvic floor if possible. Like, what was your vision of how you wanted birth to go? Well, again, I'm Ukrainian. I'm stubborn. I'm strong. And so I was like, women, our bodies have been created to do this. And so I want to just channel my own strength and my ability to show up in the ways that I need to show up while I am birthing. And so my plan was to birth at home for as long as possible. So I got a birthing ball. I got those electrode things that you put on yourself. What are those called? TENS unit. Yeah, I got a TENS unit. My husband and I, you know, went to these meetings with our doula. We created this whole birth plan that we were going to labor at home for as long as possible. And then I wanted to go to our hospital when I needed to go. And so I had asked my doctor, my OBGYN, about, you know, what was available. Was there a birthing tub? And she said no, but she did say there was a birthing bar and that you can bring whatever you want. So if you wanted to bring your birth ball, you can. And she was very positive about doing whatever birth plan I wanted to do and said, I am happy to catch your child in any position. So wherever works for you and wherever you're comfortable, I'm in. (laughs) But I know your personality. I feel like that would strike you to come up with a position that she's never delivered a baby in before. Kind of, yeah. So my personality is both oh, I'm a rebel, so I'm going to try to do this crazy position that she's never seen so that I can brag about it and be like, yeah, I'm the one who (laughs) delivered in this weird thing. And I'm also an obliger, so I love to just acquiesce to whatever's normal. So odds are I either would have been birthing, you know, on three legs with one leg up next to my head, or I would have been, like, on my back, perfectly positioned. In stirrups. Yeah. Right. I wish it would have been the first one from that point forward. They would call it the, do you want to give birth in the past exact position? Yeah. Do you want to do the genopy? The genopy. All right. So one of the other, but basically it sounds like you want a relatively uninterventive birth. Yeah. I really thought that I could learn to trust my body and my body would tell me what I needed to know. So I was worried about the medication getting in the way of me being able to feel things. And to be honest, I think I was worried that the medication wouldn't let me be as controlling as I wanted to in regards to my experience. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds accurate. (laughs) Self-reflection. Okay. So as you get closer, how do uh, things start to turn? No pun intended. So my last flight was at 30 six weeks. I flew back from New York. I did a two week tour of performances. And then I said, okay, I think it was actually 35 weeks. And so I had looked it up and apparently you can fly on most airlines up to 36 weeks. And I was like, I could be the woman who delivers a baby on the plane. Like that would be fine if that's my story. But I think also that will cause my husband a heart attack. So I should probably just lock it up and live in Los Angeles for the last month of pregnancy. Oh, So after we got back and I went to the OBGYN the next day for my appointment and she did an ultrasound and she said, oh, so just so you know, your baby is still breech. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, so the baby is Frank breech. That means its head is up in your right rib and its butt is in your pelvis. So she said, you know, listen, most babies have turned by this point, so we're going to keep monitoring it and hopefully he turns on his own. But if he doesn't, then you're going to need to start thinking about a C-section. And I said, no, I'm not thinking about that. No, 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 that is not my plan. I'm not doing that. So I went back the next week at 36 weeks and she said, listen, the baby is still breech. And I said, Oh, no. Like, what can I control? What can I do to force my child to flip? 
And so I started doing everything. I was coming to see you weekly, putting a lot of pressure on you to just, you know, make it flip. And you did your best to acquiesce to my stubborn Ukrainian demands. Yeah, I started seeing my therapist twice a week. I figured, yeah. <laughs> on top of that, I went to see a spinning babies professional in LA, someone who's certified to do spinning babies. So I met with a practitioner. We did a session. On top of that, I was doing spinning babies inversions all day, every day on my own. I joined the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center. I was a competitive swimmer in high school. And so I got back in the pool and decided I would try to teach my child to flip turn. And none of that was working. I was doing acupuncture and doing moxibustion. So I was really doing all the things that I could possibly do. And it's 37 weeks. We can try to do an ECV. Okay, great. Sign me up. Let's do this thing. So I go to the hospital. They do the ECV. The ECV is unsuccessful. They try four different times, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. And it was the most painful experience of my entire pregnancy, I would say. Even for the tough woman. Yeah, they were like, you are so strong. And the fact that you didn't cry, you didn't scream, like my doctor, she was like, I have never pushed that hard on someone. Like I was sore and like bruised the next day. <laughs> so I can only imagine how you felt. And I was like, listen, I was just trying to breathe through it and try to be as relaxed as I could to help the baby have the space to do it. But ultimately even sought a second opinion from a different doctor. And he said, oh, I know why she couldn't do the ECV. It's because you're too strong. And so then I had this sort of meltdown of, oh no, I thought staying fit during my pregnancy was a good thing. Did I do this to myself? Am mm. I too in shape? <laughs> this is why, by the way, I don't exercise at all. What if I get pregnant? I don't feel that Jewish guilt. So you get it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I can relate. It is. Yeah. That's yes. Right. So was there an answer to that question? About why it didn't work? No, just like, am I too in shape? Oh, I don't think so. I mean, also, no one was tooting my horn about being, you know, in ridiculous shape. So I think I was fine. It was just strong and I was carrying really small. So I think it was just compact quarters. And actually, at the end of the birth, my OBGYN said, oh, I went into your uterus to sort of figure out, was there a reason why your child was breached? And she said, no, there was no fibroids. There was no weird shape. There was nothing to indicate that anyone should be breached in the conditions that my uterus provided. So I was like, oh, I'm just having a stubborn baby. And that's why they were breached. Well, maybe a stubborn Ukrainian also that i mean it seems based on how you described yourself it yes. seems genetically appropriate okay so if your doctor went into your uterus and all it sounds like you had a cesarean birth and i'd love to know what that experience was like but it requires us to take a bonus break we'll be right back <laughs> Oh, uh, welcome back. It feels like those TV shows that like Hollywood Squares that they film like three in one day. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, it's Monday. And everybody goes backstage and changes real quick and like, <laughs> puts on a scarf for like how, that. It, yeah. yeah, now it's like Tuesday. Hey, everybody. So yesterday on Hollywood Squares. Uh, okay, welcome back. Presto, you had the baby, a cesarean birth. It, total opposite of what you were planning for. How in the last moments before your birth do you start to prepare anything, your mind, your body, your spirit for a big change in plans? It was tough, but I explored all my options. My doctor said I will not do a breech vaginal delivery, so I will only do a C-section. So I did go see another OBGYN who does do breech vaginal deliveries. I met him at 37 weeks. So I really was at the 11 o'clock hour. And ultimately, the question I asked myself was, why am I trying to prove that I can do the quote unquote impossible or the end or the quote unquote very difficult? 
is it because I feel this obligation to prove to myself that like I'm strong enough to do this? And if that's the reason, maybe that's not necessarily the best rationale for my family, for putting my husband through <laughs> that anxiety, for putting myself through that as a first time mom who has never gone into labor before. You know, I spent all this time in these labor classes asking, what does a contraction even feel like? And, you know, everyone's talking about you just push through it or you, you breathe through it. And I was like, breathe through what? Like, tell me what the physical sensation is so I can understand it. And then maybe I can figure out how to get through it. And then also as a singer, I was like, maybe I don't want to completely destroy my pelvic floor. Like the thought of pushing my child butt out first, I thought, I don't know if I want to risk that, you know, fourth degree tear. I think eh, maybe a C-section it won't be so bad you know it'll be major surgery it'll be fine yeah why is that so much different than pushing a head out through the same canal i don't know isn't the butt squishier and softer listen i can't go back now i just wondered in the moment the rationale but i mean if your baby again genetically takes after you maybe the butt is not squishier and softer <laughs> right maybe it's difficult and the shoulders maybe it's are too raised. fit to yeah. quit too fit to quit. And then next thing you know, I'm having a C-section anyway. So I also thought, you know, I've been with my OBGYN before I even got pregnant. Like this is a partnership that I've specifically chosen and to change at the last minute and go with someone who I don't really know that well. You know, he does laugh at my jokes and that is a positive, but <laughs> you know, while I'm in the throngs of labor, I might not be cracking as many. And so then where do we go from here? I don't know. Um, first so, of all, I definitely think you'd be cracking even more. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So look, there's no wrong way to do it. So you had some pros and cons to each choice. You made a choice. That's right. I made a choice and I said, okay, great. So we scheduled the C-section, but then I was really adamant on not wanting to schedule the c-section because i wanted to go into labor first i thought i'm planning to breastfeed i want my body to go into labor and i also don't want the pressure of having to choose someone's birthday like that just feels like way too stressful to then have them hold it over my head that i picked the wrong day or something <laughs> so i don't want to do that i just go into labor but my doctor was going on vacation and so she was like listen you gotta pick a day put it on the calendar so we picked a day and it was on the calendar and four days before my husband and I went out to dinner and we got burger pie and we were just living it up. And at about nine o'clock in the evening, we went to bed and at 11, I got up. And at that point I was peeing, you know, on the hour, every hour, because I was 39 weeks in one day. And I got up and then all of a sudden I stood up from the toilet and there was water all over the floor. And I thought to myself, is that where we are in pregnancy now? I'm that pregnant that I'm just peeing on the floor? <laughs> God, that's awful. Yeah. So then I went back to bed. And then yeah, a few minutes later, I felt like I had peed the bed. And I was like, I'm peeing the bed? <laughs> this can't be right. <laughs> so I got back up. I went back into the bathroom. And at this point, it's just like a constant trickle. And so my husband, you know, notices that I'm gone for a while. And he's like, is everything OK in there? And I said, ah, uh, I think my water broke. And he was like, OK. I was like, so now what do I do? He's like, well, you call the doctor. That's what you do. So I call the doctor and she's like, well, it looks like we're having an early birthday party. So it's uh, 11, 15 p.m. I will see you at the hospital in as little time as you can you know, get there. So we, you know, pack up the car, we do all the things, we get to the hospital at midnight, which worked out great because then we got an extra night in the hospital. And so, oh, uh, yeah, because you got the beginning of the first 24 hours, like exactly. by a minute. But what was interesting is that I thought to myself, wow, I'm going into labor now. I'm about to have this child and I've gotten one hour of sleep. So I went oh. to bed from nine to 10, you know, and then that was it. 
peeing on everything. Yeah, I'm like, well, I'm going into parenthood really well rested. So this is great. So we show up to the hospital, you know, I scrub myself down in the surgical soap and then they came over and they said, okay, we're going to insert this instrument into your vagina to make sure that your water broke. And as they were trying to insert it, you know, water's gushing everywhere. They're like, okay, water's broken. It's, it is confirmed. And so confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they needed an instrument to confirm that. Nope, they didn't. It was a floodgate there. And at this point, I had started contractions. And so on the car ride there, I was like, oh, so this is what a contraction feels like. Now I see. Now I see how this could be very painful and very <laughs> intense at the end. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we got to the hospital. We're checking in. Husband's putting on the basically a hazmat suit. And the contractions are picking up speed and getting, you know, quite aggressive. And so... My labor and delivery nurse came in and gave me some sort of medication. And then I walked down the hallway with her to the OR. And so when we got to the OR, she knew I was a singer. And so as they're putting in the spinal and doing all of that, I'm serenading the room. We're singing, you know, Circle of Life from The Lion King. And, oh, you know, my Matata gosh. And like, you know, and all kinds of like fun Disney stuff. And they're all cracking up and my contractions are so bad. So the putting in the spinal was also quite complicated because you have to round over into like a C shape, but you have a giant pregnant belly and you're having contractions and you're sitting on this like very thin, cold metal table. And so it was slightly complicated, but they got it. Then my husband came in in his hazmat suit and, you know, sat next to my head and we had created a playlist of some sweet songs so that our child could be born into, you know, this cool environment. And so the whole staff was complimenting the jams. We had put on, you know, Joni Mitchell and Simon and Garfunkel and, you know, just like fun oldies. Nice. And, yeah. And then had the clear drape and the blue drape. And so my husband was going to call out the gender of the child because we didn't know. And so... I was nervous. I was nervous that it would be hard to tell and he could call <laughs> out the wrong thing. And because our child was breech, his legs were up by his head. So as they pull him out, it's just like scrotum. <laughs> <laughs> There's no mistaking. Well, that is a boy. And so we were like, wow, it's a boy. That's so great. Uh -huh. So, you know, my original plan was I wanted to do skin to skin immediately. I wasn't really into the, you know, vitamin K drops, like all of that. I mean, who knows what happened? The skin to skin was a loss. I think they did all of the things over at the, you know, table. You know, I couldn't care less at that point because my organs were out on a table and I was just on cloud nine. On whatever medication they had given me, I was feeling great. And so then the doctor came and brought my son over to my head and my arms weren't strapped down, but I still was basically numb from head to toe. So I couldn't hold him or anything, but I could feel him next to me and he was crying. And so I looked at him and I just started singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow, a song that I had sung like the whole time I was pregnant with him when I was performing this Judy Garland show I do. And he stopped crying. And it was oh. this amazing moment of, wow, he knows uh, who I am. He knows my voice and it calms him. That is insane. <laughs> and so now I used to worry, oh, I'm going to have a kid and then I'm not going to want to perform anymore. Now I'm like, no, I have an invested fan. So I really <laughs> have to keep going. Wow, that's so beautiful. It's that is cool. so beautiful. And I imagine it just continues to this day. Yeah. You know, when he's fussy, I sing to him in his nursery and, you know, he just rests his head against my chest. And I feel like he knows the songs and enjoys them and they're comforting to him. And that's fun and also hilarious when I'm trying to expand his musical horizons and trying to, you know, test out new stuff in the nursery and then I'm like, I don't even know the lyrics to that song. I thought I knew it, but actually, it turns out I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I like that the baby can be sort of a initial critic for your yeah. material. How was your recovery? My recovery was great. I mean, you know, you're so hopped up on adrenaline and hormones that you completely forget that you even had major surgery. So I was just so, you know 
wired for the first few days. And it definitely hurt to laugh and it hurt to move. And, you know, I wanted to be really careful because I didn't want to ruin or have any complications from the surgery. So that was challenging when you're also trying to learn to breastfeed and, you know, stay in the hospital and then you get home and there's flights of stairs in your house and things like that. And so the breastfeeding was really challenging for us. He had an upper lip tie and a posterior tongue tie. And so it was super painful. Also because he was breech, his hands had been up by his head for his entire journey in the womb. And so when I would try to position him on either breast in cross cradle or football hold or any of the holds, when he would get frustrated, he would start batting me with his hands and the hands were in the way and we would try to hold them back so that he could get on to the nipple and he hated it. And so it was a very frustrating experience. It was also so painful for me that I was like, I thought this was supposed to be so joyful. This is actually so awful. I hate this. And so we worked with a few lactation consultants and Eventually, I went to an ENT and I said, listen, not only do I want to breastfeed, so you got to fix this tongue tie, but also he can't have any back of tongue tension. Like, this guy's got to be on Broadway. And the <laughs> was like, you know, I think it's a little early for that. But just <laughs> no trying to pressure. Keep his options open. No yeah. pressure. <laughs> so eventually, you know, after a few days of doing bottle feeds and getting some donor breast milk and using that to supplement, when I tried to reintroduce the boob after healing my scarred and raw nipples, my son was like, listen, go back to that when I have this very easy bottle that I've now learned to love. So I don't think so, mom. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right, fine. Again, the Leo baby strikes, you know, I thought that I could control everything and it could be my way. But what I'm learning through this entire pregnancy thing is that as a parent, you can have an idea of a plan, but the person on the other side has to choose to participate in the relationship and in the plan as well. So this is all just a lesson that I'm learning as I go. Yeah. Like they always say, you could lead a baby to milk, but. Right. Or something like that. Wow. What an incredible journey. And also you're tough in every way. You're tough in plowing through things. You're physically tough. You have a lot of endurance and you're stubborn. So I think to be able to kind of take all of those different journey twists in stride and, you know, check out your options and make a choice given the cards that you're holding and follow through on that choice. It, it takes a different kind of strength, you know, a kind of the strength to surrender, which is a, a different kind of strength. And here you are again, proving how strong you are in now that way as well. I think you're right. I think that the strength to surrender is really the lesson that I learned. And you know, so often when I was explaining the trials and tribulations that were happening toward the end of the pregnancy, so many people, I think, in an effort to be kind, were like, well, is the baby's healthy? And I thought, yes. And what about how I feel? What about the mother? You know, as long as the baby is healthy and as long as the mother can accept the situation and forgive herself for whatever guilt she's imposing on herself for situations or circumstances that may be completely out of her control. So I think that that was also something important to remember that, yes, of course, we are all wanting the baby to be healthy. And we also want the mother to be healthy, both mentally and physically. Yeah, that's extremely well said and demonstrated. Jenna, thank you so much for coming into my life. You're a breath of fresh air and sounds. Thanks. <laughs> and thanks for sharing your story. You're powerful in many ways, powerful story with all of us. Every time I talk to somebody, there's something I learn. Every time we do a podcast, I learn at least a thing. And I've learned a lot here today. So thanks. Especially the pronunciation of Swarthmore. Swarthmore, but I still can't get pedagogic. It's okay. Come in for a voice lesson and we'll work on it. We'll work Perfect. on your articulators. Okay? It's a win-win. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So where can we find you online? You can find me at jennap.com. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter and TikTok at the Jenna P. Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at the Jenna P. The Jenna P. But it's jennap.com. Jennap.com. Yeah. And Maybe I should change that. 
Well, it could be both. You could have the Jenna P point to Jenna P. Are you now my social media manager and marketing? I mean, if you're going to teach me how to articulate, it's the least I can do. It's so funny because chiropractors work on articulations where your bones come together. See, and now we're mm. more kindred spirits. The oh sphincters are gosh. related. Ugh. It just never ends. Okay, so the Jenna P, I'm going to check you out from our Instagram at Dr. Berlin, D-O-C-T-O-R-B-E-R-L-I-N. And don't order yet. Jenna P is going to write maybe not only one, but two amazing blogs for the all new informed pregnancy blog, which I cannot wait to read. All right. So I'm going to go check out the blogs and you can too at informedpregnancy.com. <laughs>